welcome to the MTA Podcast Series, a weekly audio cast featuring interviews with recognized industry professionals, and your host, Ed Carlson. I think the consensus is always very plausible. I always joke that investment strategists practice the art of the plausible. Tuesday, July 20th, 2010, and today's guest is Michael Santoli. Michael Santoli is an associate editor for Barron's, the Dow Jones Business and Financial Weekly. He writes the Streetwise column, offering a forward-looking take on the financial markets, illuminating market trends, and identifying investment opportunities. Mr. Santoli is a regular on-air contributor to several cable and broadcast networks. In August 93, Mr. Santoli joined Dow Jones and Company as a reporter for the Dow Jones News Service and covered the securities industry. He moved to Barron's in February of 97 as a staff writer and write, wrote The Commodities Corner. In 1998, he began writing the striking price column covering the options markets. Before joining Dow Jones, he worked in New York as a reporter editor for Investment Dealers Digest from June 92 through August 93. Mr. Santoli has received two Dow Jones Newswires awards for distinguished real-time journalism. Born in Manhasset, New York, Mr. Santoli received a bachelor's degree in history from Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. Michael Santoli, welcome to the program. Oh, thanks very much. I'm glad to be with you. Oh, wonderful. Michael, I have never heard anyone have anything bad to say about the Barron's Magazine. Um, you know, the, the worst anyone's ever said about its sister publication, the Wall Street Journal, is, yeah, it's a great paper, but it sure piles up in the corner. You can't even say that about Barron's. It's just a fantastic uh, uh, periodical, and uh, we know you're a big part of it, and we're very excited to have you with us today because we don't want to talk about Barron's. What we'd like to talk, begin our discussion today talking about is the financial media on the uh, the television side. Um mm-hmm. Let me let me just start with with a basic hypothesis here. Yeah, and I'm asking you, is it true that as the market falls, CNBC viewership falls? Do you know anything about that? In general, uh, I would say yes, unless the market is falling very dramatically. If it's really in meltdown mode, if it really is uh kind of a in collapse as we saw in 2008, you do get a spike in viewership. Um, but once that cools off, once that sort of crisis period ends, mm-hmm. uh, it does tend to uh, it does tend to sort of track the market. Generally speaking, um, what I'll th- what I'll say is that I've seen charts of uh, CNBC ratings that track pretty well with the VIX. Um, oh, really? So it, yeah, which which obviously means that as the market gets volatile and more quote interesting or more scary, um, <laughs> then you do have an uptick in viewership. But that but that's been for the last you know, a couple of years when the markets have obviously not been uh, been climbing steadily all that much. Uh, but in prior periods, yeah, it was pretty much uh, as people got more greedy because the market was going up, then viewership went up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, um, last Thursday at CNBC Mobile Web, there was an item appeared and the headline read, Growth is Firming at a Slower Pace. Now think about that for just yeah. a moment. Growth is firming at a slower pace. Does that does that sound like spin? I actually saw um, a reference to that. Yeah. Um, well, it, it sounds like spin, whether intentional or not. <laughs> and so well, and that's I, what I'm know, getting at. Right. That's where I'm heading here. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I think that there is a general sense of wanting to foot whatever new data points come in to what the latest trend is, what what your sort of bias is in terms of what the the latest trend is. So if you sort of thought that, you know, well, this number is, you know, it's above the worst of what we saw not too long ago, um, but yet it it had backed off, that is a little bit of a of a uh, sort of backward way to, to characterize it right there, firming at a lower pace. Uh, obviously, it's it's not firm with the prior number if it was at a lower <laughs> a lower level, right? Right, right. Well, let, let's take it one step further. Um, John Williams of ShadowStats.com recently wrote, uh, 
More recently, following an interview on a major cable news network, not CNBC, I was advised off-air by the producer that they were operating under a corporate mandate to give the economic news a positive spin, irrespective of how bad it was. Michael Santoli, is that a fair characterization of financial television? I do think, uh, depending on the venue, I, I mean, I think that here's what you have to really keep in mind. They are mostly in the business of feeding their sort of lowest common denominators viewers um, what they expect or hope to hear. So I do think that there is something of uh, of a bias towards saying, you know, let's tell a happy story if we have to uh, kind of turn it one way or the other, let's default to somewhat more positive mode. Uh, but again, this that happens only when the overwhelming drama is not things are terrible because then they feed it just in the other direction. Um, I, I think there was probably no doubt that uh, at the very worst of the financial crisis, uh, you saw folks on TV that were, you know, literally it was real-time panic, and you actually saw it in how they were, were treating things, uh, whether it was the famous rant on the floor of the CBOE, uh, CBOT uh, on CNBC Kelly. or something else. Yeah. Um, okay. So I do think, yeah, in, in, in what you might characterize as normal times, I do think that, that, that the you know, financial television uh, tends to really have, it's an extension of the standard sort of sell side and buy side commentary, which of course is also in that in that mode generally of you know whatever whatever the market is there put the, put your your stated target up ten or fifteen percent and that's kind of the way you go. Um, so yeah, I, I mean I think that that's it's fair to say that in most times um, the spin will be in a in a more positive direction. Okay, so. Um you know, this is something that most of us wonder about, and some openly criticize. Uh, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna characterize what you just said as agreeing with the uh, uh, the observation that the media has this inherent uber bullishness that it actually does exist. I think it exists mostly because uh, the people who actually perform financial journalism are almost entirely not trained as economists, traders, analysts, strategists, anything like that. Um, and therefore, they sort of default to having to deal for their sources or for their kind of, you know, to fill their airtime with those sort of standard uh, net bullish investment professionals. And so if that kind of bleeds in, and, and again, in addition, there's an incentive to try and, um, you know, to try to return to the, to the happy days when markets went up all the time and therefore their audience was big. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't think they have a clear view of what works. I mean, the viewership really? is in what looks like secular decline along with retail trading volumes. <clears throat> and it's, it's very hard to fix exactly what types of programming really drives ratings higher, unless it's sort of the occasional, you know, catch lightning in a bottle with a certain type of show that pulls in a bunch of active traders like Fast Money on CNBC. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Um, you, one one more uh, short discussion on CNBC before we leave this topic. You mentioned the lowest common denominator viewer, and, and that's that's got to be the perfect segue to Jim Cramer's program. Uh, <laughs> Now, we're not gonna, we'll make it clear, we're not talking about Jim Cramer here as a person. He's been so successful, how can you fault him for putting on funny hats and beeping horns on television? He knows what sells. So let's give it to him. But let's talk about the approach that's being taken in that program and pro programs like it. We'll just use mm -hmm. that as the, uh, the model since it's the most popular. How, how, how in the world can an average investor differentiate between investment advice and entertainment? Right. Um, yeah, they, they almost can't. And the way you know that they can't is if you read the length of the disclaimer that airs at the end of, of, of Kramer's show, it's all about trying to have it both ways. Do not take this as financial advice. We, do, we are not advocating any of these positions on and on and on, um, but it only meant it's education or entertainment. But the reality is everything is... is, is taken from a point of view of you want to buy it, you want to sell it, you want to own it, you want to dump it. And so how is that to be distinguished? I mean, it's obviously taken as uh, as some kind of advice by 
dint of the fact that some of the recommendations move a lot on what he on what he says. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you're right. I mean, the typical person is not distinguishing very much. Well, you know, although I will say some do. Some will say, you know, obviously I don't, you know, I don't trade what he what he recommends to trade, but I kind of get a kick out of him and I watch it that way. It's it's, it's a well, bit sure. of a joke. So, but yeah. they know it's entertainment. And, some and do, we all, yeah. some do, some, exactly, some do and some don't. Okay, so if that's the case, you know, we've spent the last two, three, four, five years talking about regulation of the financial industry. Um, should there be a Chinese wall in the business news media separating entertainment from advice? And, and how even possible is this with the First Amendment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Well, that's the thing. I mean, you have to essentially amend the First Amendment to do that. Um, if it is categorized as uh, as, as part of the media, um, unless it's, you know, kind of libelous or fraudulent, where you're essentially trying to get money out of somebody, uh, by, by making certain recommendations or having a self-interest there, um, it's, it's really not easy to do that. It has to be by way of a self-correcting mechanism, um, by way of just kind of disclaimers and, uh, and all that. I, I mean, I really don't think there's a, um, there's a good way to do it. Uh, the libel laws are not, not really applicable in most cases. You know, that's a one check on, on, on runaway media. So it's really not terribly possible uh, mm-hmm. to, to do that under the current standards. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well, enough about um, uh, CNBC and television, and let's move on. You know what? As a matter of fact, let's come full circle and go back to that opening quote I used from you. I think the consensus is always very plausible. I always joke that investment strategists practice the art of the plausible. Explain that quote to us. What's that mean? Well, I mean, by definition, the reason that most people believe something is because there's enough evidence for them to substantiate an opinion, right? And that's why I say it's often very plausible. You can't completely dismiss whatever what, what, what most people uh, have come to believe. And by talking about how investment uh, strategists practice the art of the plausible, of course, that's a play on the old saying that uh, politics is the art of the possible. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, investment strategy is the art of the plausible is because what, it, what does an investment strategist on, at a brokerage house do? They get sent all over the country and the world to take meetings with clients just to sort of try to cement the relationship of that firm with those clients. They really do not even, most of them pretend to be delivering, you know, alpha or real uh, kind of juicy investment ideas that nobody got to before. So they're going to walk into that room, and the, 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 the bias of the person you're meeting, the client, could be positive on the market, negative on the market, mm-hmm. be very extreme one way or the other, or be very confused. And so th- your pitch has to always be kind of the most central, plausible you know, thesis, and a lot of times that means just kind of sticking with the herd and having one or two little threads that come out of it. It's interesting. Um, if I, I find that, if I talk to, to hedge fund managers or, or, or um, mutual fund managers, you ask them what the value is of those, you know, broker trust strategists coming through their office all the time, and they do take the meetings, you know. It's that they hope to get from that strategist a sense of what other clients are thinking and saying. So they're really just this conduit for figuring out what competitors are thinking and doing to try to get a sense of, you know, wh- what might be neglected, what might be a crowded trade, et cetera, uh, as opposed for people saying, hey, please give me your GDP forecast for 2011. I mean, that's kind of no, no more valuable than, than anybody's necessarily. So um, that's what I, I, I meant by that. And, and I, I think there's a real art to figuring out times when the consensus seems to have really gotten it all wrong or even trying to figure out specifically how the, how the sort of uh, consensus is expressing itself through, you know, investment positioning. All right. Well, you know what? You just took us to uh, the next uh, item in my notes, and the, uh, you're going to allow me to even skip the introduction and get right to the heart of my uh, my uh, questions here. Uh, let, let's st- let's start with this. I you must read a lot of research. Uh, be, tell us first. What what are sell side research packs? Oh, they're just sort of a daily compendium of pretty much everything that an analyst has put it put out at that firm, you know, overnight that either changes uh, investment rating, updates you on the investment thesis, changes analyst estimates, whatever. It's it's sort of a blast of everything. Got it. All right. What tools do you use to write your column, regardless of whether a Wall Street analyst mentions them or not? 
Well, first of all, I do actually read a ton of, of, of those sell side packets, mostly to try to get a fix on where most people are thinking, where they, what the, their common view is. Not really because I say, wow, that's a great one, let me chase it. Uh, so I do kind of have that as a baseline. Um, I, I read a lot of um, sort of more independent type, I guess you might call them newsletter sorts of, uh, of market commentaries. Uh, you know, these could be sort of one-person operations, <laughs> Uh, and and I read uh, a lot of kind of aggregated aggregators of um, of material like something called RealClearMarkets.com is a great uh-huh. I think uh, sort of blog aggregator. It gives you a daily take on just exactly uh, some interesting stuff, not the standard news type stories, but some some things with some point of view attached to them. Uh, and really anything I can get, I have, there's a sort of a standard group of folks as, as a lot of people in this business do you know keep in touch with you say hey what are you thinking what are you seeing um, and those are often the most valuable because you get over time to a sense of how people think what they what their sort of strengths are in certain environments and such mm. and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of forever you know uh, going back and forth with people on that um, so that's you know it, it sounds rather you know disorganized or chaotic, but that's kind of it's very it's very much pull from where you can and get an impressionistic sense of of where people are at. I, uh-huh. I do look at a lot of explicit you know sort of sentiment indicators and and things like that, but I don't I don't sit there and, and just in a vacuum sort of look at a chart or look at a spreadsheet and say I now have come to an opinion about this. Yeah, yeah. You know you, you don't start writing your column until Friday afternoon. Uh, what time yeah. is what, what time is your deadline for a newspaper that lands on my porch Saturday morning? For me to hand it off to an editor, the the, uh, the deadline's about six uh, p.m. on Friday. Um, it kind of gets chewed over for you know an hour or two hours, and then by eight or eight thirty, all copy has to be shipped out of here um, to the printing plant. So really, it's a newspaper type turnaround and that's why yeah. in fact we're on ugly newsprint because we can do that and you know most magazines if they're glossy they have a two-day lead time oh is that right okay. yeah pretty much I had no yeah. idea yeah well all right so let's say uh, it's crunch time and you need to get that column out the door let's say it's been a big week you know a lot of people are going to be looking forward to your column when it's crunch time michael who do you listen to who are your favorite who analysts like and if yeah. you've got any favorite technicians uh, sure. Give us some names, and 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 I mean, if if your favorite technician is is the you know the old standard names we always hear, that's great. But if you got any new names for us, we'd love yeah. to hear them. Well, you know what's funny is um, there's one who I I do use as a touchstone. He has a weekly piece, um, and I have this hunch you might have might have seen his William Gibson, um, because he mentioned that CNBC headline that you, that you referenced. Um, so he's a strategist. He's on kind of out on his own now, I guess. And I get his weekly letter, and I just feel like he both explains his process very well, and he has that kind of humility of not pretending that you know he knows you know where the next two percent are coming from, up or down. Uh-huh. Um, so I do, I do use him. I am very friendly uh, with uh, with with John Roke, who is one of those guys you see all the time. Um, so in terms of technicians, you know, those are the guys you'll uh, I'll sort of fixate on because I sort of know what they've already been thinking and I wondered if anything that happened this week altered it. And that's that's a big one. Um, I do look every week at the work of a guy named uh, Robin Carpenter. It's Carpenter Analytics. I sometimes quote oh, him. Yeah. And he tracks, um, you know, hedge fund positioning and other real internal uh, market dynamics that I almost never have the space or ability to truly explain. But I sort of take from it, okay, that either confirms or refutes what I've already kind of thought of and that happens to come on a friday so it's often a uh you know let's sort of a touchstone to uh, to sort of f- figure out if i've really gotten it wrong oh okay and, you know by the way i often i often won't make a big a big proclamation about what's right or what's wrong simply because um you know i'm sort of not seeing the ball well as i would put it right right michael we're down to our last uh, minute literally uh and i had hoped to uh, touch on a little bit of your your personal history i know that uh, you became interested in journalism while you were still a teenager and describe yourself as a newspaper addict um is it true you don't make investments and and just to combine both questions my two final questions who've you who've been your greatest influences as far as being a journalist 
Well, you know, I would say, well, no, I don't make uh, investments aside from sort of real standard retirement fund stuff. Um, I just feel like that's just easier to divorce myself from. Plus, we do have uh, restrictions here, as you can imagine, in terms yeah. of the conflicts of interest. So we, I kind of just prefer to just leave that away um, and not, not even engage it. Um, in terms of influences, it might be slightly surprising. I, um, I like... Um, uh, Lewis Lapham, who was for many, many years wrote this lead column and he was the editor of Harper's Magazine. Um, not because I sort of loved, agreed with his politics or, you know, felt like, you know, he was, he was breaking any news, but because he had this personal voice and he weaved a lot of sort of subtle ideas into these long essays. Uh, I like, as a columnist, I like Mike Lupica, the sports columnist of the New York Daily News. Uh, even though, I, again, I don't always agree with him. I like the fact that he developed the voice. You kind of know where he's coming from. And um, he also likes to kind of put in a lot of snippets of things, of sort of observations uh, that aren't really fully formed thoughts or ideas, but they're, uh, they're always kind of uh, interesting. And, you know, I think the biggest thing in this business is have a sense of what people might already have seen and read and thought and then try to give them a little something different. It's not obviously always easy to do that, but those guys fall into that category. Okay. All right. Mike, it, it, we, it's been great having you with us today. We appreciate uh, you taking the time to uh, talk with us. It's, it's actually, it's been very interesting to get uh, an insider's take on your own industry. Is there anything else you'd like to mention before we go? I was just going to mention, with with regard to sort of technical analysis in general. I mean, uh, I, I'm always interested to see how um, how technicians, uh, some of them anyway, uh, like to kind of stick up for the discipline itself and say we, you know, we had it right in this case and we didn't have, you know, and therefore nobody mm -hmm. listened to us. And um, <laughs> I think that that's something to get beyond. I actually think once the the discipline has gotten this level of maturity, you know, it's only a it's only a, a real worthwhile pursuit if there's divergence of opinion within it. And of course there is. And to mm -hmm. pretend that it's sort of a standard, you know, kind of black box of thinking um, is probably not not all that constructive down the road for having it be, you know, accepted as something more mainstream. That'd just be a quick observation. Interesting. All right. Our guest this week from Barron's has been Michael Santoli. And from Seattle, I'm Ed Carlson with our recording engineer, Shane Squark, in New York City. Say goodbye, Shane. Goodbye, Shane. Let's keep our stops tight. Good day.